talk about faith and fighting for your faith. And it's something I've talked about before a long time ago, years ago, and somebody reminded me a couple of weeks ago about that first message. And that message was more geared toward the actual fight. And I remember talking about the stance that you have to take when you're fighting and what contending is all about and just a different approach. But today I just want to talk about the basic elements of faith for us as Christians. So today's message is geared towards really two different audiences. So there are those of you that are saved, that confess Christ, you know salvation, and you have a certain level of faith in your life by virtue of that. But there are also some in here today that don't know Christ. And some of you may not be interested at all. Some of you may have been dragged to church for any number of reasons. It's mama's birthday. I don't know, but you're here. And so as I go through this today, I would like you please just to listen and think about how faith can impact your life if you'll give it a chance. Because everybody doesn't give it a chance. But I'm talking about a specific type of faith. We have faith in a lot of things. We have a lot of misplaced faith sometimes. We have faith in self. Sometimes we feel like We have the power. That if I just try, if I just push, if I just strive a little bit harder, then I'm going to get the victory in this thing. That I can do better on my job. That my children will love me more. That I have a better house or a car. If I just do it harder and faster and swifter and stronger, because the power is in me. So I submit today that that's a mistake, that we do not have the power. Sometimes we put faith in other people. We put faith in our husbands, our wives, sometimes our children. We put faith in our boss at work because we just think that person is going to take care of us. That person is going to do us right. That person... They're going to give me that big raise that I've been waiting for all these years. You know, we have faith in institutions, the government, even the church. That if I just believe in the church hard enough, the church will take care of me. But again, that's all misplaced faith. That's not where faith belongs. They don't have what it takes to take care of us. Our family doesn't have what it takes to take care of us. Our community doesn't have what it takes to take care of us. They're genuine in their efforts, and I'll grant that. Take a church like this, for instance. This church is a real community. There's a lot of people here that are friends. We genuinely love one another. You come here, you have a good time. You know, if things go wrong, it's like, man, at least I've got my church. And that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. I praise God for churches and a community like ours where I have sort of a fallback. You know, sometimes, you know, I can't always go to my family. Sometimes I need to go to, you know, pastor or I need to go to somebody else or I need to go to the outreach because I need a piece of meat. could only buy veggies this week. Things happen in life, like Pastor said. And so we're very dependent on one another. But the Bible has a specific definition of faith, and it's found in Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which is the part that we're all familiar with, But then verse 2 says, for by it, 
The elders obtained a good testimony. The elders obtained a good testimony by their faith, not by their works, not by the community, not by their jobs, not by their families, not by themselves, but because of their faith. And it's a specific faith within that specific faith. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Because our faith cannot be in man. Our faith has to be in God. There are different levels of faith. Faith, faith, faith is an intriguing subject because faith kind of goes all over the place, right? You can be a person of little faith, or you can be a person of a lot of faith. You can be a person of no faith. You can be a person that trusts in possessions. You can be a person that trusts in people. You can be a person that has no trust at all. I used to tell people, I don't even trust myself. Before I got saved, don't you trust me? No. <laughs> I don't even trust myself. Why would I trust you? I know somebody else can identify with that in here. Because we're fickle. We don't know what we're going to do. We talk a lot about what we would do in certain situations. Well, if they did that to me, I would do this. Well, you don't know what you're going to do in that situation. You may do the complete opposite of what you think you are going to do. We're talking about fighting today. And you know, I don't know about y'all, but I've been in a couple of fights. <laughs> Look, you don't know what's going to happen when you get in there. You decide, I'm going to fight. When I was a kid, I used to like to fight a lot. One time I fought a girl. <laughs> she messed me up. <laughs> Won't do that again. <laughs> Girls don't fight fair. <laughs> but you don't know what's going to happen, right? You decide, you're in a situation, something goes down, you jump in there, you're all hot and bothered, you decide you're going to fight, you get in there, and you don't know what, I mean, you have all these plans in your head, right? Well, when they do this, then I'm going to do that. And then when they do that, I'm going to do this. And I know I'm going to counter. And you get in there, and you just, you know, you're getting pummeled. <laughs> you don't have time to think about all that stuff. Which is why fighters train so hard, because they have to get to the place where what they do is just reactive, that they're not thinking about it, that they have muscle memory, and they get in a fight, and they don't have to think about all that stuff. Yes, they're thinking about strategy, but what their body is doing, they've trained for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, repetitively, conditioned themselves, got themselves ready, so that when they get in there, they can just fight. They don't have to think about that. Y'all ever watch the box? Is Andre? He's not probably not here today. But the box, if you watch a boxing match, in between the rounds, you know when the camera always flashes over to the corner, and you always see the trainer in the box is there like, yeah, you got to do this, you got to do this, right? And the box is like, whatever, give me some water. <laughs> right? That always cracks me up because, you know, you're, he's in the fight. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's trying to deal with it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 4 and 5. It says, And my speech and my preaching were not without persuasive words of human wisdom. This is Apostle Paul. But in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Our faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And that's what I said when there's a specific faith within the specific faith. Because first of all, you have to have faith in something. Those of you that walk around saying you don't have any faith in anything, actually have faith in something. You have faith in the fact that you don't need faith. But you're wrong. Because you do need faith. You need faith just to live. 
You may decide to put your faith in something other than Jesus Christ. You may decide, well, I'm just not going to believe in the Lord. And it could be for a number of reasons. It could be something you saw when you were growing up that you didn't like about church folks. It could be that members of your family were saved and they were not a good example. You could have what pastor calls sheep bites where somebody in the church burned you. That never happens, right? Where you go to church and you're feeling pretty good and you're built up in your faith and you're believing and then somebody does something and you're so hurt and rejected by it that you can't bring yourself to believe again. So you've translated what somebody on earth did into how it affects your relationship with Christ. I think that's another mistake. Some of you have never heard the gospel in your life. There are people that walk into this church and it's their first time ever setting foot in a church building. For those people, I just want to encourage you. Because there is something worth believing in here. We don't just go through the motions. We have a good time. Our worship is genuine because we really believe in God and we worship God and we love God. And God does so many things for us and through us. God is a benefit. A benefit. To live without God is to live without his benefit. Consider the benefit that God can have for your life today. It doesn't have to look like what you think it should look like. Your salvation is personal. It's a relationship. Don't look at me and think you have to live the way I live, that you have to talk the way I talk and walk the way I walk because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior. God knows you because he created you. The Bible says he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. He knows your personality. He knows how you live. He knows your likes. He knows your dislikes. He knows what you think about him. But in spite of that, God is available to you. And then there are those that think well of God. And they even say, yes, I'm a Christian. I was baptized in a Christian church. I went to Sunday school. I learned something about God. But yet they don't walk with him. you also have a loss of benefit. You're actually forfeiting the best thing that could ever happen to you in your life. And maybe you've never considered it. But this is why we're here today. Because we, sh we should have faith in God and not in man. The scripture says our faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And so it's okay for us to acknowledge the wisdom of man. God grants us wisdom, and he grants us understanding, and God is merciful, and he sows into us, and he lives in us, like Pastor just said. So all those things are great, but there has to be relationship, and you have to have faith in God, who is on high, in order to acknowledge anything else that he's done on earth. The thing about faith that I find interesting is that it's not just about what you believe. It's also about what you do not believe. I do not believe that I am the worst because the Bible tells me that I'm the head and not the tail. I do not believe that I will ever be forsaken because the Bible says he will not leave the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. I do not believe that believing the Bible is optional. If somebody asks me about my faith, I usually have pretty simple answers for them. Sometimes we like to be theologians and then we lose people because we get too deep. We want to be all deep. I don't like being deep. I like to be kind of shallow. Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you believe in the devil? Yes. 
Do you believe if I'm a good person, I'll still go to hell? Yes. Do you know Christ? No, you're going to hell. You don't have to dress it up. What am I dressing it up for? When you read the Bible, it tells you that's the way it is. Do I know more than the Lord? No, I don't. Do I know more than the disciples? Do I know more than anybody that wrote those 66 books? No. Why would I reinvent the wheel? When I was a kid, we had a little plaque on the wall. I used to tell this story in Harvard Sword all the time. It was a scripture, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. So that was there. Every day I went into the house, I saw that. Every day I left the house, I saw that. Every once in a while, my mom would take us to church. I went to the Salvation Army Church when I was a little kid. I bet most of y'all don't even know that Salvation Army is actually a church. They don't just ring bells at Christmas. They do stuff. We went to Sunday school there. It was great. That's where I learned all the little songs, got introduced to worship. My brother was here. Recently, some of you met him from England. He was our piano player in, in Sunday school. If you met him today, you would never believe that. <laughs> and I love my brother, but he took music to a whole nother level in a different direction. So I was telling somebody that it's interesting because the differences in our lives are actually what opens the door to allow me to minister to him. Because if we had everything in common, it's actually a little bit more difficult. So he'll come and he'll ask questions, which makes it easy for me. He doesn't understand what we're doing here. Even though he knows about church, our mother was very devout, he has a lot of questions, but it actually makes it easy. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later in the message. Sometimes we need that friction in our lives. That friction has a purpose. That friction has a purpose. Sometimes the friction is what opens the door to the conversation. Sometimes you're in the middle of a disagreement, and you're like, man, God, why, what is going on? But God has a purpose even in that, in everything. Think about Paul and Silas on the Damascus Road. They had an argument, and then they went separate ways. But when we read about them today, it's like, man, they were awesome. They were great disciples. Their lives were perfect. Nothing ever went wrong. Not true. <laughs> the disciples were amazing people. They were willing to sacrifice it all for what they believed. So the question today then is, well, what do we believe? And when I say what do we believe, I mean, okay, let's use the word actually. What do you actually believe? I'm talking about faith. Isn't faith about what you believe? Faith is about what you believe. What do you believe and what do you not believe? What do you actually believe? We used to live in Virginia. In Virginia, they said they believed the Bible from the index to the concordance. That got kind of a hold of me while I was out there. So that's what I believe. So you don't get to pick and choose. If you're going to say, well, I believe the Bible, you have to actually believe the Bible. If somebody asks you, do you believe in Jesus Christ? You have to actually believe in Jesus Christ. If somebody asks you, can God still perform miracles? You have to actually still believe that God can do miracles today. If somebody asks you, did Jesus rise again? You have to actually believe that he rose. You have to actually believe that he overcame death and the grave and that he rose and that he sits on the right hand of the Father and that he intercedes for guys like me. You have to actually believe it. Because that's what faith is. I'm starting to get a little up in age, according to my children. 
They like to call us old. But I am old enough to remember a few things that not everybody remembers. So when I was about 14, somebody gave me a mood ring. <laughs> Y'all remember mood rings? <laughs> I'll be talking to somebody. I look down on my ring. My ring would be black. <laughs> then I'll be like, oh, I'm supposed to be mad right now. So I start yelling at them, you know. Mood rings. But we're not supposed to let something like that dictate to us how we're supposed to respond in a situation. We can't rely on that stuff. We need the Holy Spirit for people like me. I wasn't always together, <laughs> as y'all are finding out. This has nothing to do with anything, but... <laughs> y'all remember pet rocks? <laughs> I was like, why would you get a rock? <laughs> Can you walk a rock? <laughs> So, so in this scripture right here, we learn that we can't put our trust in man. We have to put it in God. And then, if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, God has a little bit more to it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, it says, and this is Apostle Paul sowing to Timothy, who was a young minister at the time. He says, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, and then he says, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's pretty harsh. He said, I delivered them to Satan. But it says, he's telling Timothy that he needs to wage good warfare. Good warfare. It says, having faith and a good conscience. And then the rest of it, He's basically explaining what the consequence will be if you don't. Because there are consequences. I mean, some of us like to think there are no consequences to this thing. There are consequences. You know? God gives us a lot of instruction for our own benefit, for our edification. And then there are some things that he mandates, gives, us to them, gives them to us as a command, and we're required to do them if we confess faith. If we say we believe in God, we show our love to God by being obedient to his commands and obeying his word. But if you don't, there can be consequences. But here he's telling Timothy, he wants you to wage good warfare. So we're talking about fighting, right? Warfare. Warfare is a serious fight. There's a difference between the kind of fights I got into and warfare. Warfare involves strategy. It involves movement. It involves equipment. It involves logistics. It involves preparation. It involves a lot of people. It involves understanding your enemy. It involves knowing where their vulnerable places are. It involves knowing where to attack them. It involves going for the victory at no matter what the cost. It's warfare. Going to war. The Bible says that we are soldiers in an army, which means that we may be called upon to fight. In fact, we're always called upon to fight. 
We always talk about Romans 6, right? Put on the whole armor of God. And it talks about all the different things that you have to wear to be prepared for battle in Romans 6. Well, God didn't put that scripture in there for nothing. It's there for a reason. We have to dress for battle because we're going to fight. The question is, are you willing to fight for the God that you say that you believe in? Everybody's not willing to fight. In times of war, there are always some that turn and run. There are always some that lay down their weapons. There are always some that surrender. So the question is, are you willing to fight? I love the story of David and Goliath because David was willing to fight. Because in the physical, the odds were against him. He was going up against a giant. This giant was supposed to tear him apart. But he knew that the Lord God of the hosts of heaven was on his side. Because he had faith. And he believed that God would help him in the battle. The thing is, do we have faith to believe that God will help us in the battle? Because we're in a battle, whether you want to be in a battle or not, right now we're in a battle. We're in a spiritual battle. If you look around right now at the world, if you, even in this country, there are so many things going on that this is a time where us as Christians need to stand up for our faith. We need to stand up for what we believe. We need to not back down, and we need to actually believe that God's got our back. Amen? There are two battles that are involved. Timothy. Thank you for joining us for Times of Refreshing. This program is a production of the Well Christian Community. You can learn more about our church and the various ministries we offer by visiting us on the web at www.thewellchurch.net or by calling our office at 925-479-1414. Or if you're looking for a church home or visiting the Livermore area, we would love for you to come by and visit us. Our service times are Sunday, 10.30 a.m. We are located at 2333 Nissan Drive in Livermore, California, 94551. For direction to our church, call us at 925-479-1414. Until next time, may Jesus Christ be highly exalted in your life, and may His Word bring you a peace that transcends all understanding.